Researchers since the early 1970s have been experimenting with artificially created nucleic acids such as GNA, which stands for glycol nucleic acid, TNA, threose nucleic acid, and PNA, peptide nucleic acid. Of these three, the most commonly used is PNA, which is considered a highly stable molecule, far more stable than naturally occurring DNA. In other words, our dirt's better than yours. DNA denatures or melts at temperatures as low as 10 degrees Celsius, but PNA remains viable at temperatures as high as 100 degrees Celsius. Imagine a super soldier with PNA instead of DNA. PNA is used today to alter gene ex expression as an anti-gene therapeutic agent to fight cancer, as a probing tool during DNA analysis, and as a component of antiviral, antibiotic, and antiparasitic therapies. You may have consumed something at some point that had PNA in it. LNA is another synthetic nucleic acid which has gained popularity of late. This locked nucleic acid is used to stabilize DNA fragments in PCR. DNA microarrays where millions of very short sequences of DNA are bonded to a medium such as glass or a silicon chip use LNA as the glue. In 2001, a startup Danish company called Santaris <laughs> they look like potatoes, announced successful use of LNA's remarkable properties against the hepatitis C virus. The LNA in the medication bonds with microRNA, sorry, bonds with microRNA in the hep C virus, preventing the virus from duplicating. Essentially, the LNA locks the gene in the off position. Synthetic DNA is becoming more and more common, as we'll soon learn. Modern-day Victor Frankensteins play with God's dirt like children with tinker toys, thinking themselves gods in lab coats. Not much different from Victor Frankenstein. <clears throat> Mary Shelley's, Shelley's horror story, Frankenstein, was written and published in an age of reason and enlightenment. The agrarian culture was slowly dying yielding to the iron push of the mechanized and soulless industrial revolution. Iron mixing with clay in a most difficult marriage. Mary Wollstonecroft Godwin was born in 1797 in London to Mary Wollstonecroft and William Godwin, who was a political journalist and a writer. Mary's well-known mother, one of the first feminists of her day, died only days following her daughter's difficult birth. But Mary Shelley taught herself by reading the socialist books that she found in her home, or by absorbing conversations among her father's visiting friends, who included poet Samuel Coleridge and Aaron Burr. Mm. Percy Bysshe Shelley was also a constant visitor. The radical young woman found a deep and quick kinship with Shelley, and the couple ran away to France in 1814, leaving Percy Shelley's pregnant wife to languish and eventually commit suicide. During a summer in Switzerland, Mary Shelley spent a miserable holiday indoors due to constant rain. With her, st uh, her stepsister Claire, her, who was pregnant by Lord Byron, and her lover per Percy Shelley. To placate her boredom, the four told ghost stories by the fire in the evenings, and Mary began to write what would become the first, her first published novel based loosely on German folk tales and the very real experiments of Erasmus Darwin. Sorry, there you go. Darwin, who was grandfather to Charles Darwin, founded the Lunar Society of Birmingham, an Enlightenment dinner club whose members referred to themselves as lunatics. <laughs> the club's most famous member is Benjamin Franklin. Darwin's many writings include the book Zoonomia, which foreshadowed his grandson's theories on evolution. In Zoonomia, he writes, Would it be too bold to imagine that in the great length of time since the earth began to exist, perhaps millions of age, 
before the commencement of the history of mankind, would it be too bold to imagine that all warm-blooded animals had arisen from one living filament, which the first cause, this is his sort of God word, which the great first cause endued with animality, with the power of acquiring new parts, attended with new propensities, directed by irritations, sensations, volitions, and associations, and thus possessing the faculty of continuing to improve by its own inherent activity and of delivering down these improvements by generation to its posterity, world without end. It sounds like he's describing one of the nanobots that Jeff Rott was talking about earlier. In the final line, Erasmus writes, it's because it's the part, let me start this again. If the final line sounds familiar, world without end, it's because it's part of the final line to glory be to the Father, which is sung in many liturgical churches. What a strange line to end with. And the great cause. Hmm. I'd like to read some of the minutes from those lunatic meetings. After reading this, one can appreciate that Darwin considered himself a lunatic, and I wholeheartedly agree. <laughs> Darwin further developed this lunatic theory in a long poem published after his death called The Origin of Society. I tell you about Darwin for it grants us insight into the learned and intellectually stimulating discussions round that fire in Geneva, Switzerland, and into the mind of 19-year-old Mary Shelley as she wrote of monsters created by man. I do not ever remember to have trembled at a tale of superstition. This is from chapter 4. Or to have feared the apparition of a spirit. Darkness, darkness an entity, had no effect upon my fancy, and the churchyard was to me merely the receptacle of bodies deprived of life, which from being the seat of beauty and strength had become food for the worm. Now I was led to examine the cause and progress of this decay and forced to spend days and nights in vaults and charnel houses. My attention was fixed upon every object, the most insupportable to the delicacy of the human feelings. I saw how the fine form of man was degraded and wasted. I beheld the corruption of death succeed to the blooming cheek of life. I saw how the worm inherited the wonders of the eye and the brain, and I, pa I paused, examining and, and, and analyzing all the minutia of causation, as exemplified in the change from life to death and death to life, until the midst of the darkness a sudden light broke in upon me, a light so brilliant and wondrous yet so simple that while I became dizzy with the immensity of the prospect which it illustrated, I was surprised that among so many men of genius who had directed their inquiries toward the same science, that I alone should be reserved to discover so astonishing a secret. Remember that Mary Shelley had been raised in a progressive home where philosophers lunched and libraries filled with Greek and Roman plays, poetry, and politics beckoned to her curious mind. Victor Frankenstein speaks for Mary and for many in this clay and iron world as he exalts at his own genius, his illumination, his apotheosis or ascension to godhood. Now there is another lesser known book also written by Mary Shelley and my dear friend and fellow researcher Sue M. Bradley has written many articles on this lesser known novel. The Last Man, and I have to thank her for recommending it as an addition to my own lengthy reading list. Published in 1826, The Last Man is one of the first post-apocalyptic stories supposedly fashioned by the book's writer from rescued and ancient leaves containing the Cumaean Sibyl's prophecies of things to come. The myth of the Sibyl or prophetess of Cumae goes something like this. During the time of the 50th Olympiad, a strange old woman arrived in Rome in disguise. This old woman appeared before King Tarquin and offered him nine books of prophecy. Her price being far dearer than Tarquin thought deserving, he declined to purchase the books, and the old woman burned three of them 
but then offered the remaining six to Tarquin, who still declined, thinking it too costly. The old woman then burned three more, leaving only three precious volumes of things yet to come. Tarquin couldn't resist now, and he paid the original fee, a king's ransom price for the three books. Once the deal was sealed, the old woman disappeared from Rome. The story goes that these three books were kept in the Temple of Jupiter on Capitoline Hill, but that they burned when the temple burned in 80 BC. Accustomed to being able to consult the prophecies, Tacitus tells us that Rome's rulers then sent to all of their lands for any prophecies of the so-called Sibyls. This collection of Sibylline prophecies was then enshrined in a rebuilt temple. Later, Augustus moved all of these to the temple of Apollo. The Sibylline prophecies were burned as pagan by the Christian general Flavius Stilicho in 405 AD. But five years later, the Visigoths invaded Rome, and they claimed that the pagan gods had given them the city as payment for the burning of the prophecies. The Sibyl was considered a guide to Hades and was said by Ovid to have lived an amazing thousand years, having gained near immortality as a granted wish from Apollo himself in exchange for intimate favors. However, when she recanted in her promise to fulfill his pleasure, Apollo twisted the spell so that the Sibyl lived for a thousand years, but she slowly disappeared until she became nothing more than a whispered voice in